This conference will now be recorded. So look, we've got somebody coming in. I heard a corn beep. <laughs> <laughs> tonight. Thank you, LaSalle, for the excellent dinner. Appreciate that. All right, let's start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Super, thank you. Um, we don't have too many people in the audience. I'm going to assume there's no citizens for no public comment. All right, good. We'll go to number one, which is acceptance of the meeting agenda. Uh, hopefully, everyone's had a chance to look at it. And if there's no objections or anything, I'll entertain the motion. I shall move to accept the meeting agenda. Second. Beautiful. All in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Any nays? All right. That was quick. Number two, approval of minutes. Same process. I'll entertain a motion if there's no objections for the uh, minutes. Move to approve the minutes. Second. Super. Thank you. Oh, all, <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That uh, passes. We'll move on to the lead planning agency for air quality agenda. Uh, number three within that agenda is the Air Pollution Control Division. Um, for those follow along, that will be on page 13 of the packet. Jessica, I guess it would be online. Yes. Okay. Yeah, can y'all hear me all right? As far as you know. You can. <laughs> can y'all hear me all right? Okay, great. Yeah, I'll just kind of talk through some of the items that are highlighted in the handout we provided in the packet, starting with a few updates that we have. Um, we are hosting a couple of different public meetings um, related to the greenhouse gases. The first being a meeting regarding our greenhouse gas inventory protocol. Um, that will be October 16th. And then the next day on the 17th, we are hosting a meeting regarding the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, we are also continuing to implement the work of the air toxics bill, including we um, citing locations. Um, for the final three of the six air toxic monitoring sites that we are standing up. Our first public meeting regarding that will be in mid-November. And all the information to register for those is available in that handout. Um, related to air toxics, we are also standing up a reporting requirement pursuant to House Bill 22-1244, with the first reports being due in June of 2024 for subject entities. Um, and right now we are, um, we've developed a template for those reporting, those reports to come in and we're soliciting public feedback on those and are providing more information and having meetings with um, entities that are subject to that reporting requirement. Um, to provide a few updates on the Air Quality Commission meetings, um, this past month in September, the Commission granted the Division's request for a ozone related hearing in December, as is tradition now. Um, and so we are beginning the rulemaking process for that. And any request for party status will be due on the 12th of October, I believe. 
Um, the commission also heard the hearing regarding regulation number 27 um, regarding the greenhouse gas emissions from industrial manufacturing sector or the GEM rule. Um, and they'll take final action on that at the October meeting. Also, coming up for the commission on October, uh, um, on the 17th, we'll be hosting the Air Quality and Health Symposium. That is a full Sure. Jessica, I think we lost you. Can you hear us? Common provisions. Another issue for the regulation number rulemaking for three regarding the. Jessica, you're breaking up. Questions is whether this is just her or this is like the feed, you know what I mean? Like the broadband issue. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, she said, Do you have somebody else on the call to make sure that this is just a her thing and not like. Hey, Becky, can you hear us okay? Can you try talking? Hi, we can hear yes, we can hear you. It's She's the one who's ha we're having issues hearing. Okay, thank you. Why don't we come back to her? Maybe. Yeah, I just, her, I just sent her a chat saying okay. that she was breaking up, so and I haven't gotten anything back from her yet. All right, well let's let's move on, and uh, we'll come back to her at the end of the air quality agenda. So number four, think, regional uh, air. Oh, Jessica, are you there? Yeah, sorry, I have really bad connection right now as I'm traveling, but that was the end of my report, and I was just going to say, please reach out with any questions on any of the topics uh, that we talked about. And thank you all. Great. Well, convenient. Any questions for Jessica? All right. Seeing none, thank you, Jessica. Thanks, all. Okay, number four, Regional Air Quality Council handouts. Um, number five is the uh, MPO air quality program updates. I'll turn it over to Suzette to introduce our um, guests. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so we're get, if there is somebody new on the agenda tonight, you may have noticed her name is Dina Boytok, and some of you may recognize that name. She was for a while our air quality representative on the North Front Range Council. Um, Dina worked for many years for the Air Pollution Control Division. She has since left them, them and started her own company called True Roads Environmental. Um, with a, with a Medora leaving the North Front Range MPO, we really had a gap on some technical expertise that we needed um, in, the, in the office to help us with the air quality items. So we've uh, pulled in Dina under contract, um, and so she has been working with us. She was I believe somebody needs to mute themselves. There we go. Okay. Um, so she was the she was the off uh, the major author of that letter for us, um, with providing all that technical information. She's also going to be doing the MPO reports for us. So she's monitoring Bear Quality Control Commission reports and some of the RAC. Um, reports and reporting back to all of us about what we need to pay attention to. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dina, um, and you will probably be seeing her um, monthly at the council agendas to just talk about air quality items, unless we don't have anything going on. So Dina, go ahead. Hi there. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm going to be walking through the summary of air quality related activities um, and the corresponding table that uh, was included in your packet. This being the first time I'm reporting to you, um, I've taken a run at highlighting what I think you might find most interesting, but please let me know if you have questions or would like more less or different information um, now or in the future, and I'll do my best to respond. Um, 
As you just heard from uh, Jessica, there are a number of things that were happening before the Air Quality Control Commission and the Regional Air Quality Control Council, <clears throat> Air Quality Council, excuse me, um, this past month. Um, I, I need to correct something that was in my document because Jessica just highlighted that for me that, that while the commission was set to adopt greenhouse gas trading program um, and control requirements for 18 facilities, it sounds like that got pushed to um, October. But the fact that they're establishing a trading program is, is a big deal. Um, related to the ozone um, state uh, implementation plan rulemaking that she was discussing, just as a uh, just a reminder, um, this rulemaking is really to shore up a number of pieces of the SIP that they were um, they couldn't take before the Air Quality Control Commission last December um, because they wanted to go back and redo like the emissions inventory and that inventory kind of had the ripple effect on a number of the analysis that they had to do. And so they're back at it this year, kind of shoring up that severe SIP under that 75 parts per billion standard. So with that, the RAC jointly um, shared information as well as what the updated modeling results were in their meeting. And um, they did happily show that all monitors are going to be attaining that 75 parts per billion in 2026. So let's go a little bit deeper into that, what this, this year's ozone SIP rulemaking um, will be touching upon, because there's a number of um, different aspects to it. And as a reminder, you've got a link to all the posted materials in your document if, you, if you'd like to go look um, more in depth. So with the SIP revisions that they're coming forward with, um, there's a number of chapters um, that they had to um, put forward and get adopted. And so what this really means is um, I just mentioned that they revised the um, emissions inventory, uh, basically the data that they use, and it's kind of a ripple effect they use in all the different um, um, analyses that are required under the Clean Air Act. And so that's why you see this, this chapter three, that's the base data that's used in all the analyses. This chapter four revision, which is a demonstration of submission, uh, sufficient emission reductions have happening over time, showing that we are progressing towards attainment. Then you've got the chapter five, which is the actual modeling demonstration showing that all monitors are going to um, meet the standard in 2026. Um, and then you have chapter 11 demonstrating the transportation planning efforts are not going to, you know, get in the way of um, the area attaining the standard. So there's a number of <clears throat> regulations um, that are being revised and there's a new regulation that they're moving forward with. So in the air quality standards, that's where they're lowering the motor vehicle emission budgets in 2026. And I understand that um, uh, the Northrop Range MPO or, um, staff have verified that the, you, you can meet um, this, those new um, budgets in 2026. There are some also some regulations that are being revised and the more substantial ones are related to regulation seven that's specific to oil and gas. And um, specifically there, they're um, addressing or they're addressing internal combustion engines and setting more stringent requirements for those engines. They're also beyond the oil and gas sector, they're uh, addressing engines more broadly um, in all sectors in regulation 26. So you're seeing some more stringent requirements kicking in there. In addition to that, we have a new proposed Regulation 29 that is specific to lawn and garden equipment. And that's establishing requirements for state government, municipalities, and county governments using small, uh, 24, 25 horsepower and lower um, handheld and push gasoline powered lawn and garden equipment. And that's specific to the non attainment area. So we have this new regulation and that's something that's um, of you know, significant interest. You also have some corresponding you know, technical support documents. I'm not gonna really go into that as well, but that's really what you're gonna see as part of this ozone SIP 
um, hearing this um, December. Now, the RAC has um, uh, put together an early alternative to the proposed Regulation 29 on lawn and garden equipment, and it is different and in some aspects um, appears to be more stringent. Um, the RAC's alternative um, applies beyond government entities. It has some different definitions in it. It has a different um, equipment threshold. And yes, there is a, a comparison table that I put together that is in your, um, your packet. Certainly um, talk about more in depth that, um, either today or another time, but uh, this just kind of gives you a, a comparison to understand how they differ. One of the more significant differences is that the RAC goes beyond what the division has proposed by also proposing uh, basically a, a, a sales prohibition on the small lawn and garden equipment. Um, and that's an element that the uh, division's proposal does not include. So going beyond this ozone-related effort, or maybe kind of related to it, the division had proposed um, revisions to Regulation 3 related to emissions reporting and permitting. And specifically, they were proposing to establish greenhouse gas emission fees that apply by statewide um, to 2024 emissions. Um, interestingly enough, the rulemaking notice that the commission has put forward does not include that regulation three. So I think they're gonna peel that out and address that at another time. But um, it is interesting to, to see, you know, that they're, they're planning on moving forward at some point in the future. And um, some of the documents that are still in the, um, the commission's materials online still talk about what their proposal was. So that's something um, to track. Okay, so the council may want to decide if and how to engage with this ozone rulemaking. And there's, there's a couple of ways to get engaged. To engage. You can get um, involved formally or informally. Um, you can do so on your own or jointly with other entities. So there's a number of different options. The reason involved would include um, the fact that um, it is very common for rules that are proposed to change and often change dramatically by the time you get to the hearing, if not at the hearing. And so um, formal participation ensures that you are involved early in that process. You see how things are being are changing and you're able to weigh in earlier in the process as opposed to waiting until there is a public sharing of what the evolution of the, the rule language is. Um, <clears throat> you may also get involved informally. Um, so you, there are ways to provide comments both um, verbally or in writing. Uh, to um, whether it's parties to the rulemaking or to the commission itself. Um, the interesting thing is, is the um, those folks don't necessarily have to um, have to listen. Now, historically, they do regardless because they they want to hear um, from people, um, but um, technically, they don't necessarily have to listen. Um, and that's more kind of a, a legality issue. Regardless, I think they would. So um, there's ways to submit comments um, again. So you can submit them in writing or you can register to provide um, uh, public comment um, at the beginning of the hearing. So there are a couple of deadlines to keep in mind if you decide to um, engage in this process. So if you are uh, considering pursuing um, formal party status, the deadline to submit information um, requesting that is on the 12th at 5 p.m. Um, otherwise, you can submit written comments um, to the commission uh, by November 28th at 5 p.m or register, register to provide public comment 
um, when that window opens and those time slots go really fast. So you're going to want to be on it if, if that's the option or the route that you want to take. Last Dana, yes. Hey, sorry, can I just interrupt for a second? So the rulemaking that they're doing in December is the changes to the SIP that gets us back into compliance. This was the piece that they didn't pass earlier and they pulled out and now they're going back and and finishing it up, so to speak. So yes. this is the piece they're talking about. So the, the piece that is most of interest to the council is the motor vehicle emission budgets. Um, and I would just say on to what Dina is saying is that about applying for party status or not applying for party status. During this whole party status discussion, people can submit alternative proposals. And in the past, there have been some submissions of alternative proposals that ratcheted down the motor vehicle emission budget or proposed that. Um, so, so to say that I'm leaving it up to the council about whether you want to actually do party status because it, it does, it's a, it's a significant amount of work to do that, I will just say. Um, but that is one of the things that happens during the party status. What she was saying, things can come up, things can change um, during this whole, the, between now and December. So um, that would be one of the reasons for thinking about if you want to go apply for party status. Well, Is that fair, Dina? Yes. Can we pause and discuss that for a second? Sure. Any comments regarding the direction we take? Go ahead, Chris. I'm very yeah. formal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so that's a, that's a quick turnaround. October twelfth, we'd have to file party status back to October twelfth. Is that right? You know? Yes. So that's next week, next week, a week from today. Yeah, I think. That's time consuming. Well, yeah, I mean, and then would that um, is that something Dina could do? Do we need, you know, I mean, and and then we would have to come to some kind of consensus around what we would be asking for. Right. It just seems it seems like a lot. We may be better off, and and I don't know. Giving some of the differences between Larimer and Weld, just to be honest, I mean I don't know that we would, you know, necessarily agree with some of the. Um, so so, gosh, all that to say, I don't I don't know, and maybe we're better off submitting written comments from each community. Or from, you could do it from the MPO's perspective too, or from each community. However you want to, I mean, however you want to do it. I think just raising the issue so that you're all aware of it um, is really what the intent is, and so just to figure out what you what, all, what your desire is going forward. Well, it sounds like we don't have time to do anything other than informal and submit questions, right? I mean, we probably could pull something together to do, you know, to file for party status, but. Um, I think, as we've talked about when we've done party status in the past, it is so it follows a very structured um, process about when you have to have things submitted, about when you have to have things in front of people, how people respond to you, who you submit it to, and you better make sure you get it right. <laughs> so you really have to dot your I's and cross your T's when you're submitting things. Um, I would just say, from our perspective, we have looked at the revised more close. I'm not going. It is very close, but we do pass for yeah. right and exactly. But I think that the only thing to help us if somebody does, and this has happened in the past, there was an alternative proposal that came in front of the Air Quality Control Commission that lowered the motor vehicle emission budgets. It did not go anywhere just because there was no science, I guess, behind it that, that talked about why they should revise those the emissions budgets downward. So. Um, that would be the only reason to think about filing party status, and for most of it, it's just honestly so we can monitor it. Um, well, I guess my thought would be as long as we're able to ask the questions, if we have the questions, that's all I'm concerned with at this point. So that would be the informal way of doing it. Mm -hmm. right. But okay. so, other comments? Yeah. I just, I'm not sure we've had enough conversations about it to like get to a place where we want to file formal party status. Had we like. I mean, beyond the letter that Dina prepared, I'm not sure we've had a lot of conversations in the space. So, I mean, to do something formally and then try to assemble documents and like Suzette said, it's a pretty complicated process. I don't, I, I, I guess I just don't see the need for doing that, but um, 
but if other people are feel differently, I, I don't know. Anyone else? All right, I think we're going to stick with the informal. Can I ask a question to Dina though around? So when, when you're going through this chart and some of the differences of what APCD um, of the proposals like around, let's say the lawn and garden program, if RAC proposed it, but it's not on the list for APCD, does that mean it's probably not going to be implemented? I don't, I don't think it means that at all. It just means that there has to be, for, for legal reasons, one proposal um, and the RAC is making, you know, putting forth its alternative very early in the process. Often what I've seen is, you know, the, um, the commission will um, look at both. Um, they will hear testimony. They will look at the documentation and the analysis. I've seen them pick, it, you know, pick pieces from two different proposals and cobble one together. So um, that is certainly an option. I would not um, say that it's not likely, you know, the RAC's proposal is not likely to be um, implemented. I'd have to dig a little bit deeper, and we're gonna we're gonna want to watch the like the economic impact analysis um, that how that evolves over time as well. Okay, thank you. So I guess the only remaining question is how do we funnel the questions if we have questions through you, Suzette, or individually, or 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 through Dina. Um, you can well you can send them to me, and I can and Dina and I can talk about them. That's fine. But I've, and as I said, Dina is just, she's now just on board with us and it has been maybe been about a month is all. So we're really trying to figure out what, you know, what she, what she needs to bring in front of us um, so that we're aware of things. And I think she's monitoring the RAC meetings, she's monitoring their like, control commission meetings so that as things come up, she can report those back um, to us. And, and I think um, even if you're monitoring some of that stuff sort of between meetings, um, you can still see out on the out on their website. They still do have a lot of information out on the AQCC website when it comes to rulemaking. So she can also watch that and let us know if anything's coming up. Well, let's funnel that through you, then, okay? Suzette, if yeah. you don't mind. All right, Dana, you got more? I do. Um, if I may add one more detail to this this discussion. Um, it is possible to file for party, party status and then withdraw it later. Um, so if you want to put together something and, and filing for party status is fairly simple. Um, it, all you have to do is identify who you are, why, why this is of interest to you, um, and who the contacts are um, to engage through this process. So it's possible that you could file now and then withdraw it should you decide not to, um, just to kind of preserve um, the option. Um, it's also possible to file for party status late. You just have to show good standing. And you could, you know, you know, this this um, council could basically say, hey, we had to go through the, the process of getting our our uh, members on board. So those are two options to 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 consider. Yeah, I need to add on to that when I was talking about some of these late proposals that can come in. That's using her example of filing for late party status. We did it at that that one time when that one came up because it was changing our motor vehicle emissions budgets. So we did file for late party status, but you have to have the reason for why you want to come in late. Yeah. Yep. Right. We're good, Dan. All right. Um, so there's just a list of upcoming meetings. I had some of what um, Jessica was mentioning, but not all. So um, probably between the two of us, we have a more holistic um, list. Um, just a couple of things to note. In October, um, the commission was set to have a rulemaking hearing on um, a rule related to light duty and medium duty low emission vehicles and zero emission vehicles. So this is um, really speaking to dealers making more levels of vehicles available, as well as um, tightening down emission standards for vehicles. So um, that's something that may be of interest to you. Uh, there is this uh, modeling forum that's gonna be held on the 26th if you wanna register, and that's where they talk more in depth about the modeling and the demonstrating attainment 
um, with the 75 parts per billion standard. And they also talk about what they're going to do with the next steps, because once they get done with this, they got to move right on to the next SIP. And I know it's a little confusing, but that one would be the serious SIP under the 70 parts per billion standard. Um, and then there's a couple of other highlights, um, but I will just stop. And are there any questions on, on what I've shared today? Any questions for Dina? No, no, just a comment, sir, Mr. Chair. Go right um, ahead. I don't know if I like her working for us because I just get more depressed because like, <laughs> she's just going to really piss me off more here. No, you information. Good. You knew that was coming, right? <laughs> I just sit here and it's not you. It's just the, what you're reporting. But so you want to report less? <laughs> well, sometimes bliss is bliss is great being ignorant and my head in the sand. But now I got to listen to all the crap that I don't want to hear. Not the first stop. I all about you. Make that clear, John. Can you see the top of the hole? You're gonna get. I, I don't know if it's a hole. I think I think most people are uh, afraid to say what I'm saying. I think people are probably feeling the same I'm feeling. But and some of this stuff is getting to a point where. Why don't they just move to California? Yep. <laughs> Sorry. I had to make a statement in a call. You feel better? You got it off your chest? You, no, I got a lot more, but I'll let it go. We'll hear more in the future. Commissioner, Commissioner Stevens is correct. We have a differing opinion. So, so can I add just maybe one thing? In the list of um, upcoming meetings, there is a meeting that is listed um, that it says it's uh, the 17th of this month, and it says the AQCC Air Quality and Health Symposium. Um, I asked Commissioner Stevens as our RAC rep if she could attend. She cannot. I cannot attend. This is really sort of being able to meet the Air Quality Control Commissioners and spending some time with them and learning some of the health effects. I think we're willing to go and speak my piece. Oh, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. I don't think Johnny would be interested. Anybody else? But I'm just saying that that that's what that meeting is about. So it's really a chance to meet our air quality control commissioners if that's of interest to anybody. Do we have that something for you? No, no. Okay. We don't. Okay. Just All to right. clarify what it was. Any other questions or comments for Dina? Dina, good job. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to thank you, Dina. That's very detailed. It's 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 excellent, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. All right, thank you. Yeah. We're in no way insinuating you should move back to California, though, know, either. That's no, not you. That is not you. Hey, Adam Hayden. She's amazing. Dude. No, it was not directed at anybody at the table. <laughs> she's a native. Did you hear? Yeah. No, she's a California native or Colorado native? Cal Colorado. Colorado all the way. <laughs> oh, my God. That was close. That was 50 50. It could have gone either way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on, gang. Let's move Thank on to the action item. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Letter the EPA, Suzette. Yeah, so um, page 15 of your packet is the letter for the EPA. We did talk about this um, in draft form last month. Um, the intent of this letter is to request a meeting um, of EPA to talk about our background ozone issues or what we're calling our non-locally controllable emissions. Um, what is happening, and this is happening across most of our Intermountain West, is the, the our non-locally controllable emissions are higher than the standards that they're setting. So, um, you know, we can have as high as 75 parts per billion as that non-locally controllable. That's the stuff that's coming in from out of out of our area. Um, some of it's biogenic. Some of it's you know just coming in from Mexico, California, Asia, other places. Um, and we really wanted to talk to EPA about how, what do we do with this? Because the end result for us, as you've already seen, we're in the non-attainment area for ozone. We went from moderate to, ser to serious to severe, and we're just going to keep getting ratcheted down because we can't meet those standards because most of it's out of our control. So um, this, this letter is requesting um, a meeting of EPA to talk about how do we handle, how do we handle that? Um, Arizona has already set up a meeting. I think they're the end of this month is when they have a meeting. Colorado wants to collectively set up a meeting. So <coughs> the Northern Range, Dr. Cog, and Pikes Peak um, asking for the meeting for e with EPA as well. Um, we talked about the letter last month. I had a few minor edits that we received. Um, 
and put that those that doesn't change anything substantive, um, just some grammatical things. Um, so this the ask is is that we would like to develop an EPA approvable SIP that avoids further downgrades and sanctions, options to reduce emissions regionally, nationally, and internationally. So localized areas can account for these in their SIP planning and accounting um, for these options in any reconsideration of the, o of the ozone next future implementation guidance. So, so that's the ask um, out of this letter. We also, first of all, I want to stop there and just say, is, it, is there any issues with the letter from anybody that um, we need to talk about? Seeing none. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm in the way. <laughs> no, you're all right. Um, well, I will say that, like, Larimer County wouldn't be in favor of signing on to an individual letter. Just, um, you know, I, and I do understand, like, some of the things that the letter brought up, and I, and I, you know, I'm in agreement with some of the things, but I, I will say that, you know, the baseline standard for ozone is based on health standards, and, um, you know, it, it, I don't want to compromise that, and you know I know that the letter talks about DI communities, and I do feel that um, yes, there is some financial burden to DI communities, and there's some equity issues with that, but there's also some health equity issues, and so that's kind of the problem that I would have with it is is trying to get to a lower standard. Um, I, I'm not gonna, you know, I mean. Clearly, that I can I can count, so I know that the council has enough votes to be able to you know send it, and I, so I'm not going to necessarily call the council sending it, but I, we we won't be sending an individual letter to Lamar County. Is there any way to modify this letter? I don't. Too, I mean, too complicated. Yeah, I mean, and I appreciate that. Thank you, John. I appreciate you know you're asking, and I do think it is really hard to get into these goals, and I don't think actually a a conversation with the EPA is a bad idea to say, hey, we're we're really struggling with, with this, but we have managed to lower things. I mean, we haven't gotten within within the range that EPA is saying, but we have managed to lower things. And I'm afraid that any kind of asking for any kind of um, exceptions would, uh, you know, I, I guess I feel like we still need to really work really hard on this. And I don't think the letters, there again, I don't think the letter is offensive in any kind of way. It, it doesn't say that we don't want to try to work on this. But um, lowering those standards would mean we wouldn't have to work very hard on this. And, and I just feel like our the health of our communities is really important. And, and I know everybody at this table feels the same way about that. But that's that's the reason that we wouldn't be um, sending out an individual letter. If the MPO wants to send it with a signature from the um, from the chair, you know, I mean, I think that that's fine. But um, I, we, we Lumber County wouldn't be signing on. We have a hand raised. Online? Yes. Can I help? I can't see it. Trisha? Yes. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Kristen said. Um, Fort Collins is in agreement with all the different statements that Kristen just made, and that we aren't going to be signing on either uh, individually. Um, you know, we're committed to achieving ozone attainment and it's written into our air quality plan, it's written into our city plan, and it's written into our legislative policy agenda. So that kind of goes against everything that we as a city have worked towards and it's not in alignment with council's priorities. So um, again, what Kristen said, we don't have a problem with the MPO sending it, but Fort Collins won't be signing on or sending an individual letter. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, any other comments, objections, questions? I think what we'll have to do is vote on it for one, and secondly, let's talk about the process. You yeah. decided instead of a, trying to round everybody up to sign it, it would be better if we just listed. Yeah, listed. Yeah. So, so I just I want to be clear. Um, we're not saying that we're asking them to change the standard. We're not asking them to. Um, change anything that we need to do. The issue that we're trying to fix is the progression of being going from moderate to serious to severe to extreme, and we just can keep going down that path and we're never gonna get there, um, no matter what we do. Um, and I would say there's a, um, the Arizona um, Agricultural Association of Governments also sent a letter. 
they do have, um, they are also the lead planning agency in Arizona for that. So they have in-house modeling capabilities. Um, and in their letter, they totally removed all vehicles and then they totally removed all industry and it had less than a 2% change on their um, commissions. And that area is about almost 5 million people in, in the Hague. So, so it's, it's not, we're not, none of us are saying we shouldn't be doing what we should be doing. Um, yeah. It's just saying we, the regulation that is, and the process is coming with this is, is hard to, to, to follow. Jim. Yes. Uh, I guess I just want to make a comment in general. Because um, we've gone down this on the road of safety and we've gone down this, I guess now this, this subject. Um, if you're running uh, a manufactured line, your goal is to get your defective products to zero. And step one is having a realistic goal to get that product to zero. If you know you're going to fail, there's no reason to try. I mean, there is zero reason to try if you fail. I mean, if you guarantee a failure. I mean, I don't understand. It's kind of like, go to school, work as hard as you can. You're going to get an F. I mean, <laughs> well, why do I try? It, it makes no sense. But if you put a realistic goal in, and you have a manufacturing line that's producing widgets, and you have 200 widgets fail out of a million, you're going to look at those widgets and try to get that number better. And, and if your target is, this is what I have, this is a realistic target, then you can have a conversation around that subject. But if the goal is you're going to fail no matter what, then there's no reason to have the discussion. And I, I think, I don't understand ignoring the problem uh, makes it better. And I understand the goal of wanting the problem better, and I desperately want the problem better, but by saying we're going to ignore it, um, I don't know. It, it, it frustrates me that we fail continuously, and we are not having any realistic targets at all about what I can do about it, or we really even have a realistic conversation around it. So, yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Paul? Yes, um, my question is, does the letter have to have individual signatures? No. no. We just thought that it might carry more weight if it did. She's just going to... I get it. I, I guess that's what I come back to from what I've heard from Fort Collins and Larimer County is, I guess they don't want to be identified specifically, but then again, you know, like you were alluding to, if the chair signs it, you know, just like a mayor would sign something on behalf of the community or, you know, I... I, my point is, is I guess it's just as it's still sending the same signal. We hope they read the letter. We, you know. I guess well, that's one of two. I'm sorry, Paul. No, no, no. You're fine. I guess that's one of our two options. First option being the chair signs it, if that's agreeable with all members. The other option is just have those members that want to be specific mm -hmm. to sign the letter, or not even sign it. Well, what our community yeah. names? Yeah, I mean, I don't, which is what she was going to yeah. do. Yeah, and then leave off the members that object to it. Yeah. Which it's so probably fair. It's probably have. fair to have it in the letter that these are all the different communities that make up the MPO, and we're sending collectively this letter. It doesn't have to say yeah. one agrees or thinks it should say this, and another. Yeah. You know, we. I don't know. I'm trying to bring yeah, the kumbaya no, I to the whole thing. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, however you want, y'all want to do that. I mean, I, you know, I, like I said, I'm not going to oppose the the MPO sending the letter. I just wanted you, you know, people to know. And I, and I mean, you know, Frank, I, I take your point, but I actually don't believe that there's no way to, to lower this. I believe that there's 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 ways through manu manufacturing. It's not just transportation sector. Um, but I, I actually think the part about talking to the EPA is really good to try to get on the same page. I mean, that part I really like is sort of like, you know, you know we are trying. Can you help us figure out better ways to do this? Because we're not seeing these differences. And, you know, what does that look like in other communities? And what what would you suggest and i do think the conversation with the epa is 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 a, is a valuable thing to have i just um you know there's just parts that for me that are you know kind of the sticking points and i mentioned those you know the health standards and um you know the di communities i mean di communities have higher rates of asthma and uh, often live near manufacturing and roads and things that where their health is compromised. And so, 
um, you know, I just, that piece is, is important to me. And there again, I'm not saying it's not important to anyone else. Um, I understand people's frustration, so I'm not going to block that the MPO is sending it. But we just didn't want our name on it. I'm not sure we actually need both. Maybe we need to talk about that, but we can uh, just agree to send the letter mentioning those communities based on feedback tonight that want to be part of it and the ones that don't, we'll leave off. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the rub from Fort Collins and Larimer County specifically, not to pick on just the two of you, is one person's specific name. You know, whether it's, you know, the chair of Larimer County Commissioners or the mayor of Fort Collins or, you know, whoever the top ranking, whoever it would be, et cetera, there's not comfortability with that exact person's name, signature, you know, like we were talking about last month, having all the signatures. Is that really the rub versus just saying, hey, as a collective MPO, this is our feeling on this, not that there's not digressions with whether something's attainable or not. We're not necessarily changing the, the guardrails. We're just saying that it's, uh, you know, a collectively this letter should go to tell them, hey, this is, we're finding this hard to achieve. You know, we may not get there. We're going to try, but we may not get there. Right, you know, I think and I do the, think that, that there's a lot of that spirit in the letter. There's just a few, you know, things that I wish, you know, but I mean, there again, I don't, I, I, I think it's fine that the MPO sends a letter. We're just, you know, I don't think the rest of my board would be, you know, sure, and the sure. same with what Tricia said, you know, as we develop sort of these legislative policy agendas that, that, you know, they just don't kind of fit there. Well, I suggest that we send the letter with those members with, with title and city, right? Name, title, city. And if there's anybody else that does not want to be part of the letter, you need to speak up. All right, very good. Do we have enough direction? So I just I didn't do want to say that I, I do have some people that I know that have have you know sent back to me and said that they do support it. I actually got a resolution from the town of Milliken. I know that Dan Dean is on online, um, so we did get a, a resolution in support of the letter. Um, Evans has supported the letter. Loveland. Uh, Loveland has supported the letter. I don't Pretty think much. I sent one. I, did not. We got we got concurrence from council. As okay. did the town of Eaton. And Same Eaton has. Members. Windsor, no? Yes, no? I'm in favor of the letter. I don't, we didn't take up an actual resolution about it though. Okay. We just did a consensus and yeah. head nod and thumbs up. Yeah. So okay. Did. Well, so they, didn't, they didn't have official action either. We really didn't. They just. We have a lot of the same views from the letter. So okay. I so feel LaSalle. comfortable having LaSalle on it. Okay. Okay. Um, and then um, I'm assuming that Commissioner James, even though he's not no longer on there, is in support. She's smiling back <laughs> Anybody we miss? Bertha, what about Bertha? I don't know. Bertha, yeah, we support that. Thank you, Will. <laughs> Thank you. Never. Will's never forgotten. <laughs> I think that's everyone. I think so. So, but I'm just going to put no, so I know for sure that it's not Larimer County or Fort Collins. All right. Let's close the uh, air quality agenda and move on to the uh, NPO. Can I raise a technicality? Yes. It was on the agenda that it was an action item. Do we need to take official action because it's an action that's item? Good. That's the only. Yeah. I don't want somebody to say we didn't take official <laughs> action on it per se, and it's a. We just say yes, we want to send the letter and we don't want to send it. I'll make a motion to send the letter to the EPA uh, with the supporting communities that want to and the ones that don't will not be included in the letter. I'll second the motion. All right. We've got a first and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. aye. Nays? <laughs> All right, so first item under the MPO is a report of the chair, which is me, which I don't have one tonight, and then uh, we'll move on to Suzette. Yeah, I just have a couple of items uh, for council. Um, I know we don't talk about Van, the Van Gogh program very often, um, but I thought um, just maybe giving you a little bit of an update. We got our first new route. In 2023 on the Van Gogh program, um, it is Loveland to Gun Barrel. Um, so that's, that's the, Where's Gun Barrel? 
Perhaps, Perhaps you should take a ride. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like when you're going in the bowler off the diagonal. Oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. I know area really well. <laughs> no, no, no. I think really you should take a ride. It's a, uh, it's a lovely ride. It's a lovely ride. Yes. No, you have to drive. Um, and the other piece that uh, the city of Fort Collins is working with our Bango program uh, to come up potentially with some funds that would incentivize. Bango van riders and some uh, van pools um, oh. with the city with the city of Fort Collins. Um, and that's we're working on that. We'll have to. It's all in the contracting, but we'll have to see how that comes out. Is our numbers going up? Or are we? We're about flat. We've been about. I mean, we dropped significantly, you know, with COVID, and we've been about flat. So um, we're not. We got, we got not, one or two. We're units. not. We're not seeing our back to our steady increase to where we were. No, we aren't, and part of it is I'm kind of happy that we're not because we cannot get vehicles. I was going to say we still got that issue. We yeah. sold a ton of them. We sold a bunch, but you know they were they were over and in, hitting end of life anyhow, and we had way way more than we needed. Um, we still have enough to cover back up and, and then some, um, but you know if we grew quickly and we we have gone out the last several years now to try to get ten vans. We're lucky if we get two or three. Well, it's going to get it's worse now, depending on how long the strikes last, too. Yeah, yeah so. but I think what's happened, just big picture, is that companies during COVID discovered that uh, telecommuting is acceptable. Yeah. Well, well no, that, no, I agree 100%. I mean, so so getting the numbers we back up is, is actually not a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, and I would say the people that are coming back to the to van pooling, they're a lot more part time than full time. Mm -hmm. Like to your point, you know, they're teleworking a couple days a week. But I want to tell you something. Where I disagree with that statement is I drive I twenty five twice a week, so. and it seems like it's worse today than it was in twenty nineteen. So. I don't think population growth has slowed down, though. But there's still a lot of people on that road. And I would say if you look at the traffic counts, and you look at the, the amount of people that are on I-25, it is probably more today than it was in 2019. Well, and what I will add to that is, is I remember living in Denver when the whole I-25 expansion was going on. And the question that came up at one of the meetings was, by the time this project gets done with the rate of growth at Denver, really you got to get started and add an additional lane. Yeah. Quite honestly, I-25, by the time they're done with this, the end of this year, early next year, they really need to start on a fourth lane. 2032 is the, I think if Heather was still in line and she probably can articulate what the failure of the existing project that we have in terms of level of service. Mm -hmm. We'll already be there. Yep. The bridges are built for the fourth lane, right? Yeah, yeah, everything's prepared for it, and everything on expansion is on the outside of the room. So I think it's going to be a lot easier. It's not going to be as disruptive in our lives as it was before. And it's, it's expensive because all the um, infrastructure, the bridges, yeah, and the bridges. bridges. Yeah. Right yeah. I do have one more thing. Go right ahead. Um, Alex has been invited to present at the TDM conference this month. Mm -hmm. um, he is actually being going to be Here's presenting at two sessions that are pretty much back to back, um, but I just wanted to say that um, we are going to be talking about what's going on with our TMO and our efforts to get a TMO started in our TDM. So okay. um, we're starting to get some recognition at the state level about what the efforts of our front range, what we're doing up here in, in the way of TDM and TMOs. And I think at stack, I thank them for that. I'm sorry, say I that. thank them for that at the stack. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Can I ask you a question about the incentives that Fort Collins is going to do for Bando? Are they doing that for their um, employees or are they doing that for community members? I don't really know. Do you know off the top of your head? I don't, um, I don't, I don't know. I would just say that um, I know that um, they were trying to get some incentives about Corey. Is Corey online? I am online. I can chime in. Um, we are still, they, um, the city of Fort Collins is still trying to figure out the parameters. Um, but we believe we're leaning towards people commuting into Fort Collins um, to Fort Collins employers, whether that's city residents or city employees or um, um, employees of private employers or CSU, for example. So does the van go have to 
it, the Van Gogh vans are either in Weld or Larimer County. So if somebody was like commuting from Greeley to Fort Collins, they could do Van Gogh or vice or, or the opposite direction. Yep. All right. And then no, the other requirement is that the van starts or ends within MPO boundaries. Boundary. Okay. Um, I'd be interested in seeing what those incentives are. You know, whether we we promote that as a county to our employees, or we kind of encourage other county members to do that. I think. I mean, apparently we don't want to grow too fast because of supply chain issues and the UAW strike. But um, but. Uh, but I mean, it, 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 you know, I think that that's something. So if, if you can pass on like what kind of what they end up doing as an incentive or some of the materials that they share, that, that yeah. might be good. Yeah, we could do that. Um, I think um, like what I said, the, the devil's in sort of the details is like they're, they're, we're trying to get the money obligated because they're coming up, the city is coming up on their year end. And so we're trying to get that money sort of uh, earmarked for, for those purposes. And so it's. It's an IGA or a contract, and you know it takes a little time to work through all yeah. that. But yeah, okay. we can certainly show that. Thanks. All right. That's all I have. All right, so is that thank you. Number nine is the uh, tax report. You can find that in the uh, packet on page 22. Uh, mobility report number 10 is a handout, another written report. So we'll move right on to the action item, which is uh, and roads. If you follow along at home, it's page 23 of the pack. Thank you. The September amendment to the fiscal year 2023 to 2026 TIP includes four revisions. I will just note that last month we did approve the 2024 to 2027 TIP, but that won't go in, into effect until we get all the approvals from uh, the state and FHWA. So any um, revisions to the 23 to 26 TIP will be included into the finalized uh, 24 to 27 TIP. So the four revisions, the first comes from CDOT Region 4, which is revising the North I-25 Weld County Road 38 to State Highway 402 project by adding 27,611,000 of state SHB funding in fiscal year 24 and decreasing the previous funding uh, by $27,611. Uh, reducing the scope of the Windsor Weld County Road 13 alignment improvements project uh, by revising the project description and decreasing the local overmatch by $1.5 million. Adding one new project, the NFRMPO TMO incubator funding with $100,000 of carbon reduction program funding and $21,000 local funding each year between 2024 and 2027. And then adding the Fort Collins new project, Foothills Transit Station and Roundabout project uh, with $10,714,000 federal raise grant funding and 1,643,000 local funding. The 30-day public comment period for this amendment began on September 13th and will conclude on October 12th, and the approval by the Planning Council is contingent on no negative responses being um, submitted to the MPO before that time. The TAC discussed and recommended Planning Council approval of the September TIP amendment at their uh, meeting in September and uh, an equity analysis for the new location specific project which is the, the Fort Collins Foothills transit station project is included in the package so we'll answer any questions now any questions for Anna Rose yes go ahead I don't have a question I just wanted to make a comment that we discussed the um, the TMO incubator funding uh, dollars in the US 34 coalition meeting previous to this meeting and um, I think that um, it, it looks like that we'll be having further discussions around how to spend those dollars or to do a call for projects or to allocate those dollars to the 34 coalition. But um, for those who weren't here during that meeting, just wanted to know that we, it sounds like we'll be discussing in a further meeting kind of how, how those funds will be distributed. Um, but know that the 34 coalition kind of discussed it and um, doesn't have a recommendation at this time. But may in the future <laughs> for those dollars. Any other Is that questions? fairly accurate yes. a description of what happened? Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I'll make a motion. That was Johnny's motion. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't recognize it as anything. But, uh, please make the motion. 
Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the September 2023 Transportation Improvement Program TIP amendment to the 2023 and 2026 TIP. Great. Any further discussion? I'll second it. See, oh, I'm sorry. I'll second. second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Will says aye. <laughs> no nays. We're, we're good. Thank you. It's hard to find the button. Well, even when you do it, there's a delay. So mm -hmm. a delay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Discussion items. Uh, see that boundary discussion? Herman's online, I understand. Pam, can you hear me okay? Yes, can, can you say something again, Herman? You're a little quiet. Can, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yep, I think good. so, yep. Okay, yeah, so um, apologize for not being there in person tonight. I think this will be a pretty quick conversation though, so I uh, thought virtual would work okay tonight. Um, I think as most of you know, since early May, CDOT has been conducting a study of the consistency and transparency of our regional planning processes, the membership of STAC uh, and TRAC, the Transit and Rail Advisory Committee, and the boundaries of our TPRs. And we're starting to hone in on some draft recommendations, so thought it was appropriate to, to give you all an update. Uh, we plan to present our final report to the Transportation Commission uh, at their November commission meeting on November 15th, assuming we can get all of our recommendations finalized by then. Uh, as a quick update for your area, we currently do not have any boundary change recommendations that are moving forward for the North Front Range or Upper Front Range uh, areas. We had a lot of conversations, a lot of conversations with Commissioner Stevens, Commissioner James, Commissioner Ross over in the Upper Front Range TPR, as well as folks like Suzette and Elizabeth, those the TPR and MPO administrators and, and directors came to the conclusion that as much as I don't like the idea of having two different TPRs conduct and coordinate regional planning activities for a single county, I also recognize for your area, it maybe doesn't make as much sense as I thought it did. Uh, really appreciate the folks taking the time to talk through all the pros and the cons with us. In this case, I think bringing in the rural parts of Larimer and Well County into an expanded North Front Range TPR area, I think the cons are outweighing the pros. Um, one thing we do feel pretty strongly about that impacts uh, your area is we don't think that any single political jurisdiction should represent this uh, two different TPRs on stack. Not suggesting there's any inherent conflict in that happening, but we have 64 counties and well over 200 cities and towns and just think that it's appropriate to spread the wealth. So we're uh, encouraging uh, TPRs to look at their their uh, uh, governing documents and maybe make some changes to, to make sure that doesn't happen. That applies to upper front range and north front range. It also applies to the Pikes Peak Council of Governments and the central front range TPR. Um, and I think everyone is pretty receptive to that uh, suggestion. Uh, also, um, we do plan to have some recommendations related to stack. Uh, we plan to recommend imposing term limits for our stack chair and vice chair, and also start uh, an urban rural rotation process that's similar to the way the Transportation Commission works now. So if the, the chair is from urban Colorado, uh, from an MPO area, the vice chair would be from, uh, from a rural TPR, when that chair is done, perhaps the rural vice chair becomes the chair, and then you'd select an urban, uh, an urban vice chair, so you have that rotation. And we think it's important for that stack leadership to be represented, representing both urban and rural Colorado. Um, and then we have a whole variety of statutory requirements and best practices related to TPRs. They are governing bodies. They fall under things like open meetings laws. Uh, folks have been pretty receptive to making sure that the TPRs are adhering to the state statute, adhering to the recommendations that we have just to make sure all those boxes are checked. So uh, happy to go in and detail on any of those, but just wanted to give you all a quick update and happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Herman? At what point do we talk about stat? representation is that a later discussion or for us yeah we all 
Good to go. Yeah, so for the North Front Range, um, the only thing we're going to have to do, I was waiting until this actually is adopted um, with the Transportation Commission until we make any changes. Upper Front Range has already made changes to their bylaws to accomplish what Herman was talking about. I think we need to make a change, a small change in our articles, uh, essentially saying we would coordinate with Upper Front Range um, so that we would not have Larimer County or Weld County both on both on the stack at the same time, which is where the overlap would be. But it for could us. be a jurisdiction. It could be Larimer County and Fort Collins on it at the same time. No, ju one jurisdiction. So, no. so it can't be. So the only two that overlap is Larimer and Weld, the counties. Right. Right. So you could have Weld County and Greeley. Yeah, yeah that's what I said. Fort yeah. Collins, Collins, City yes. of Fort Collins, and Larimer County. Yes, you could have that. Yeah. Correct. Right. I thought you were saying the opposite. Sorry. No. <laughs> So is this something you need to bring to us to vote on, or yeah, because we do have meeting? to have public, we have, we have to have it open for public comment okay. on the articles. But like I said, I was waiting until um, after yeah. the transportation commission took action on it. Yeah, because the, the recommendations going forward by the stack and by the staff doesn't necessarily mean the commission goes and doesn't do what they want to do. I mean, that's you can ask Kermit. I mean, that's pretty much the case. The staff has a lot of weight, but it does. They could go and change. The recommendations too so i think it's prudent that we wait all right so when you're ready yeah put on we'll, the agenda yep. and we'll talk about it yep i do want to thank kerman yeah I, he, I think... he took on a difficult task yep. uh, and i think we all learned a little bit during the process not just Herman. but i think kerman got to be involved with all of them and he learned a hell of a lot more than he probably knew before even though he's done it his whole life but I even learned some things, and I want to thank you, Herman, and we've had conversations, and you've reached out, and you've had a lot of conversations with people, and you really weighted the, the voices of the people, and I think if you remember the first time you came out, I said, please, I hope CDOT listens to the people, and you did, and to the electeds and to the communities, and I appreciate that. Yep, thanks, and I would appreciate also, it. Yep. This is probably about the third or fourth time Herman has talked about this in about the last two days. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, say yes, I just want to say, um, I think that some of the administrative type changes that are happening are really good for, with regard to transparency and people sort of understanding the work that we do. So the idea of like not having, you know, the same communities, you know, two, two of the same like government entities re representing on stack is so that everybody can get that experience of moving through stack and see what that's like. And with regard to like having things on the website and having clear bylaws and I mean there's there's wide discrepancies between what different TPRs have and so really having some consistency so people can follow these meetings if they'd like I know that the, they're, they're so exciting I you know but, we can make but them more exciting. Well, you know, we try we try uh, but I mean just that that opportunity to have um, to for it to be a more public, the, the kind of work we're doing, I think is really important for the people that we represent and for newer electeds who might find it, I mean, who, I mean, uh, you know, maybe nobody's gonna raise their hands, but who found this kind of intimidating the first time they walked into this meeting and got thrown a bunch of acronyms and didn't understand all the different kinds of fundings. I mean, I know, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. I'm half confused tonight yeah. alone. <laughs> and so, I mean, just to, uh, you know they're going to institute like a program to onboard like newer electeds to understand some of that and you know and you know and I and I showed Her Herman Suzette some um, videos which I think are you know a great introduction to to the work that we do so I just think that it adds a le le layer of transparency you know to to what we're doing and if people then want to engage it just makes it all that much easier I can find I can find your bylaws I can find your minutes on the website I can you know I can engage if I want to so uh, all that you know I don't want to say too much more but I just think that, that those are really good and honestly I mean and God bless the people who serve in in, in chair positions but the current stack chair has been on for 19 years I mean you know like there's there's um, there's autocratic regimes in the world that haven't had a ruler that long so I mean there is some reason to make some changes <laughs> Sad part about it is the stack voted him in every year. Yeah, we did. It wasn't just he stayed on, the stack voted him in. All right, Any, anything further? Even last time.
All right, Herman, we'll let you go. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Take care. All right, let's move on to the Transportation Commission. Heather? Oh, well, let's not do that then. Uh, 2023 tip delay review. It's in the packet, page 31. Anna Rose, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thought you. Thought you were done for the night. No. The uh, FY2023 tip project delay review is um, an evaluation that we do of projects that have been awarded by uh, project funding that has been awarded by the NFR MPO Planning Council. Um, that we, we do annually to ensure that uh, funding is being utilized in a timely manner. This applies to all of the funding awarded by the NFR MPO Planning Council. So that is uh, the CMAC, SCBG, TA, carbon reduction, and the state MMOF funds. This is the first year that we have included the state MMOF funds in the TIP project delay review. Uh, the way that the delay procedure is, works that is outlined within the TIP is that um, it is looking at the milestone deadlines that were included in the project application uh, at the time of approval. And so these milestone deadlines are for construction projects, the add date, and for non-construction projects, the notice to proceed. And it has to go to add or be given that notice to proceed within the fiscal year that they had identified in their project application. The first uh, extension that a if, if a project doesn't go to add within that fiscal year, they, they are considered delayed for the first time. That first extension is approved by the TAC, and then any subsequent extension must be approved by the Planning Council. So th that just is an outline of how the TIP delay procedure works. So there were 24 projects that were subject to the uh, fiscal year 2023 tip delay review. And so there's uh, four different tables in the packet. So the first is uh, table one, which is the projects uh, that were subject and are requesting a second delay. And so there were three of those projects, um, the city of Greeley 59th Avenue and O Street Roundabout Project, Loveland's North Taft Avenue and US 34 Intersection Widening and Improvements Project, and then the Fort Collins US 287 Intersection Improvements Project. Um, so those are the three uh, projects that are delayed for a second time that we would be asking Planning Council for approval for those extensions. The next table is uh, table two, which is the 14 projects that um, are being delayed for the first time. And then table three are the seven projects that were subject to the delay review, uh, but have met their milestones and are considered not delayed. The, uh, and so just wanted to point out, this does include the Johnstown project, the Little Thompson River Corridor, which was delayed, uh, which was granted a third extension last year, uh, but has been completed at this point, so no longer delayed. Uh, table four is for Informational purposes only. In 2020, we swapped out some SCBG funds for some of our projects with the pandemic North Front Range stimulus funding. So these are no longer subject to the same delay review, but we wanted to report out on them. And so they are included uh, just for informational purposes. But those funds do have an expiration date, and uh, project sponsors have identified that they should be able to expend those funds by that expiration date. So this is just a discussion item tonight. Um, we'll bring it back for action next month. Action on just table one, correct? Yes, on granting the second extension. Okay. So, is that your way of signaling? I was raising my hand and I had to scratch my hand. <laughs> I can't get used to that. Oh, I was like this and Suzanne saw me and I went like that with you. All right, Johnny. So ahead. I have a question. These extensions are for based on what the North Front Range put in, right? This is our criteria, yes. or is this FHWA criteria? This is our criteria. But now my question is, is correct me if I'm wrong because I'm, I'm having a foggy minute. But most of these funds, they have up to ten years to expend, right? For federal funding, yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. There used to be a red list or a, some kind of list. Yes, with that yes. so that was an expended list. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
thought you were talking about the inactives list. Oh, inactives list. That's, what, that's, that's what I'm looking at, the inactives list. Right, so that is separate from this process. Okay. That's what um, I was making And sure. then, just for your information, that will be included, the inactives list will be included in your packet, I believe, next month. All right, not as foggy as I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> You're right on top of it. Any other questions for Anna Rose? Go ahead, Frank. Sorry. Uh, just out of curiosity, how, how long or how often can projects continuously be delayed? So, um, Following really a second delay is when we would start to have the conversation of whether the funds need to be removed from that project. Um, so it's not very often, most times that projects are able to, you know, there's extenuating circumstances in which they weren't able to go to add within that, you know, three year time frame. Um, so we had the one project that had a third extension, but that is very rare. I guess, is there a distinction between um, I know some of our projects were delayed, but we were interacting with CDOT, and mm -hmm. CDOT was delaying us. Right. But, you know, and there's no way to plan for <laughs> when you get the questions or what they're going to demand mm -hmm. or whatever. But is there excused and unexcused ones, or is it just all of them are equally delayed? Um, that would be a, a topic of discussion within these these meetings. If the, the reasoning that is provided for why they weren't, why they were delayed, if that doesn't seem reasonable. If you didn't have these extenuating circumstances, those are the things that um, would would maybe trigger us looking at whether the funds need to be removed or not. But we do take into consideration, you know, extenuating circumstances, the reasons why these projects didn't go to add. And, and remember, you get a couple of years. So, mm -hmm. like, like what she was saying on some of these tables, there's an automatic first year if you don't meet your your the date you said you were going to meet in your application, then you get an automatic one year extension. And then the council will grant the second one. So you got like by the third year is when you're talking about whether you can actually use the funds or not. Yeah, I'm just trying to think in broad strokes. So mm -hmm. that's money that's not being invested in the community that's mm -hmm. in a bank account. And those projects could take the money, you know, three years down the road. And you know, so you have, you have a good project, but it's not ready to go. There are other, there are some other. Um, I get this delay. I'm just yeah. trying to. Try There's to some other funding scope. mechanisms that we have in place as well uh, for like swapping funding years. You know, if a project from one city can go forward sooner than, than another city, they can swap funding. And so that's something that our, our TAC is aware of as well. If, you know, if you're seeing that you're not going to be able to go sooner if you need that extra time. We do have some of those processes processes in place, and that would adjust the milestone deadlines as well. So, so does TAC weigh in on this before it gets to us? Yes. So okay. they discussed it at their meeting. Oh, they already have. Yes. Okay. Uh, in September, and they will um, they will recommend approval at their October meeting. And, and some of this goes to. FHWA has a tendency to look at, there was like $386 million sitting in the bank at one point in time. And we as communities complain that it's not hitting the road and then there's $386 million sitting in the bank not being spent. And so I think a lot of it is, is making sure that we're holding our weight on our commitments, but yet finding avenues to help communities that need it to swap, to move things around is also what we look to do because we do know there's circumstances that make it play, but we just don't want to make the, let the feds or anybody start taking our money back. Uh, I'd almost hate to say it. You, you do let the airlines oversubscribe your money knowing you're going to have delays, but if I we, don't want to go there right if now. We didn't, if we didn't have a fiscally constrained plan, we probably could. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, now we go on to the next page. Transportation Heather is online, yep. I believe. Yep, can you hopefully you guys can hear me all right? Yes. Um all right. So uh from a transportation commission update, I know Jim Kelly did have um two vacations planned. So I assume he will be in attendance in November um, of the North Front Range meeting. Uh new commissioners were onboarded last month, or I should say five. And we'll still have to, Commissioner Kelly will have to get onboarded um, 
in the coming month. Um, they had a lot to take in, three different fiscal years. Um, I think they're definitely drinking from the fire hose, but um, a lot of decisions are headed their way. We've got a proposal for redistribution that I spoke about last um, month, and that was presented in workshop. And then obviously the direction of, and the staff recommendation for House Bill 1101 will come to them in November. So that's my commission update. As far as the region update goes, um, I'll make it short and sweet. Tons of progress on 25. The last of the asphalt paving is completed. Um, a little bit of concrete paving left, left to go, but if, I think I'll see the very picked up. Um, bad news. Um, it's news, but starting next week, northbound uh, from Mulberry to Al Canyon, we're going to start um, grinding and doing a slab replacement. So we will be down to a single lane, and um, they'll, they'll do about two miles of work a day, one and a half to two miles of work today, a day. So that will be kicking off. Um, there's a lot of landscaping work to be done in the prospect infield. And uh, we are moving fast and furious to try to get um, a spring uh, first construction package out on segment five. And that's um, my update. Super, a lot of progress. Thank you. Any questions for Heather on either transportation or uh, our four update? I'd just like to say at the stack today, um, Herman didn't mention this, but they asked if in order for us to help the commission make the decision that we should all send a letter of support on 1101 or we should individually talk to our stack rep i mean our transportation <coughs> rep so they know where we stand on 1101 so when it does come to them in november they know that we as a council and we as tprs all agree with that so it'd be something maybe we might not think about putting together so should we put them on the November, put that as an item, a discussion item for the November council meeting? I think it would be good. As long as he knows that this board, this body agrees, and I think the upper front range should probably have that same conversation. So he knows when he's walking in, he's got support of his communities and his district. I mean, the upper front range already changed from its rules, like preemptive. Yeah. Preemptively, I guess is the word. Um, so, but, yeah. but we don't need to. But you could send out an email and see if you want to send a letter of consent for that to him. Yeah, fair enough. Any other points of discussion? With Heather? With Heather. I've got a question for Heather. Uh, Heather, hi. Um, hi. I got an e Hello. I got an email from somebody claiming to be a new liaison for all elected to contact so that in 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 uh, my my par my paraphrase version, just so that you're not bothered with our calls anymore. <laughs> I, I, so so that was from Jamie Grimm. Um, she works for OPR, um, which is the Office of Public Relations. She's been around for a long time. I think there's a lot of new people that have been elected, and so I think a mass email blast. I got the same thing from Helen down in Mead asking me what's going on here. Um, I would, you have another point of contact, but I would probably just disregard that email because I think the relationships that we currently have work, but I think it was for all the newbies. Um, that just Enough said, thank you very much. I rest started. my case. Yep. <laughs> I thought, you know, nice. Heather got somebody to handle all the electeds for her. That's good. That's... All right. No, no, Anything no. Further for... <laughs> I, didn't get more... I didn't get that letter. <laughs> I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you later. I think it might have been for like like we talked about with new electeds not knowing who to contact. Like I think that that was maybe a and Herman I don't know if Herman stole on the line, but I think that that might have been like in, oh my in the, the electeds got it that she really doesn't want to deal with. That's it what anymore. I was going to say. Paul read between the lines, but she gave a very good PC response for all of us. Right? Uh, okay. We could read between the lines. All right, Heather, I think you're done. Thank you. All right, uh, stack report. That's on page 38 of the packet. That's a written report. The Colorado Transportation Investment Office, otherwise known as the CTIO, page 40 is a written report. Uh, I-25 Coalition. 
Good. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Go right ahead. I got voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think Heather touched on a lot of things. I think just a couple of other things that came up at the meeting um, last night was that, uh, she, as she was saying, segment five is looking at you know, trying to get the first construction package out in the spring. They're thinking it will take three paving seasons to get that section done. So three years, sort of like we've been talking about in segment six, seven, and eight. Um, they are talking about setting up the remaining the tolling equipment for six, seven, and eight through the fall. In the winter, they're going to be running the testing on the tolling equipment. So I think it's going to be free to use that third lane without tolling and then start tolling sometime in the spring. So um, that's, I think, the big thing that's coming along. But they're almost done with six, seven, and eight. It's pretty cool. It looks so, good, doesn't it? It does. It looks awesome. So, Heather, good job for you and your team. All right. Any questions? Thank you. This is it. All right, hearing none, let's move on to US 34 Coalition. Okay, Kristen. Sure, hopefully I took good enough notes. Alex, will you kind of cover me if I I'll try. <laughs> All right, so um, we hope to have a contractor on board soon by the end of the year or early next year. Um, we uh, voted as a 34 Coalition to make the current Coalition members the new uh, members of the board for the TMO at least initially for the 34 TMO. Uh, let's see. Um, several communities uh, volunteered to um, sign up to be on the scoring committee uh, to evaluate the responses that we received from the RFP. And those communities are uh, Loveland and Estes Park from Larimer County and Greeley and Weld County. And then a CDOT representative will also be on that board to look at that. Um, we, as I said, um, in the uh, with regard to those that hundred thousand dollars that um, that the board that this board allocated for TMOs, um, we will likely have a conversation about how to spend those dollars, whether to have sort of an open um, process for people to apply for those dollars, or whether those dollars would all go to the 34 TMO. So that that will be an ongoing discussion. Um, our next, I don't know if there's anything I missed, but our next meeting will likely be in January or February and we should have more information and we will probably have election of new officers then. So, is there anything I missed? So my notes are okay. <laughs> All right. But I took okay notes. That's good about that. Excellent. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. Let's move on with uh, Kristen again for NAPME. Okay, so now we met, met last Thursday. Um, I sent an email out to some folks, um, most of the communities um, that have uh, transit, and, and sent it to Suzette too, because last uh, Thursday we had a presentation on uh, bus rapid transit from a lot of the, uh, you know, kind of the RTD and the Denver area, and that's the second one we've had on BRTs for the Denver area. And I think that. You know, our area wants to see some of those dollars too with regard to our transit needs. And so I just wanted folks to be aware that, you know, as we start looking at a um, process to uh, a competitive process for grant making, that, that everybody sort of keeps that in mind as a, as a funding pot. And, 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 and I reached out to transit, you know, I reached out to Greeley, Fort Collins, and Loveland, but I mean, other, it's not that other communities can't. Um, Participate. They can. If you if you can receive CMAC dollars, you can apply for those dollars that we have at the NAPME. Um, but just that they'll probably be looking for projects that are well on their way, that are you know, I wouldn't say necessarily shovel ready, but pretty close. And so um, you know there are millions of dollars to be allocated through the through NAPME. And you know I do think that the board is really conscious about looking about geographically spreading out the the wealth, but after having two BRT presentations from the Denver area, I was like, okay, well, we should make, we should, I just want folks to be primed to, to get that money and to, to be able to access those dollars. So um, Alex has done a presentation. Though. I mean, I don't want to say that we haven't done anything, but I don't know why Denver got asked back twice. Well, we inserted ourselves, so Alex is coming back. Oh, good. Okay, well, then we'll get another one from Alex. Invited yourself <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Uh, I might ask, what what would these dollars be for? What types of projects, or what, what's a common thing that might be 
I mean, it's very it's very regulated under statute what they can be used for. They basically have to be used for things that would lower ozone. So, um, I mean, think a lot about the same CMAC. You know how CMAC dollars can be used. So transit, um, you know, the, like scooter kind of program. You know that you know anything that would kind of lower ozone emissions. So anything that's not cars. Anything that provides an air quality benefit, air quality benefit, and we and I, I while the criteria hasn't been created, I do. I mean, we have a pretty lengthy discussion. I think that, that this group definitely, I mean, that it has an air quality benefit is one of the criteria that will obviously be there. I will say that I, I think there'll be a big emphasis on DI communities from hearing the conversation. So I would keep that in bless you. Bless you. Keep that in mind too. I mean, every, I mean, I think everybody at the table has communities that would benefit from that. So. Um, and then I think that, I was trying to think, of, it felt like there was a third thing that would happen. Um, but I think that geographic distribution, I think is important, but there are more representatives from that Denver area. And so, you know, I, 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 yes. And the DI community piece is kind of, I think, part of the statute as well. So uh, connecting communities is really important. So it's like communities like, like for example, like I-70, how they made those changes because those communities were split. Yeah, I, I think then to add on to that, if I, if I may, yes. um, uh, we also met with Darius um, after this from yesterday, I think. Darius from yesterday? That sounds right. right. Yeah, so we were talking about some of these items and the two things that we were really talking about is uh, local match was one a question that came up, especially right. if you're talking about the DI communities that don't necessarily have a lot of money to provide local match. And then the other question was, would you be funding ongoing transit operations? And that was another, we don't know. Yeah. Answer, I think that we're going to be, uh, you know, you guys are probably going to be asked to think about as well. So those were just a couple of things that, that came up in our conversation. But that's when we invited ourselves back to present to you. Good. Um, CMAC, can they fund, um, they can fund operations for a yes. few years? Or, or so in, a, few in years? a rural area, and Anna Rose is our expert, so if I get this wrong, you correct me. But um, in a rural area, I think it's indefinite, correct? Oh, it is. And yeah. smaller, smaller. Yeah, small urban and rural areas without time limitations. Amazing. Oh, okay. So yeah. that's something for a small, if smaller communities are considering any kind of. And I think in like an ur a more urban area, it's three years and then three you step years. down in four or five. Okay. So anyway, just um, as you think about your projects and you think, I mean, I think we have. 10 million, 11, actually a little more than that, but maybe 13 million. Yeah. We have a decent amount of money right now. Yeah, that grew fast. And, then, and we'll have, be having that same, and, and that money will probably increase over the years. So we'll have around that much practically every year to give out. So it is um, just something to consider as you think about the projects that you have on your on your list of applying for that. Um, anyway, yeah, like I said, I think DI, uh, well, I'm pretty positive because of the way the legislation was written that that the DI focus and the uh, and um, something that demonstrates that demonstrably demonstrably <laughs> <laughs> what time is it uh, shows air uh, air pollution benefits is our two of the criteria. So anyway, more to come. But I'm glad Alex is presenting. Great. Any further questions for Kristen? Seeing none, let's move on to uh, Front Range Passenger Rail District. I don't know if Will or Johnny want to go first or second. Whatever you guys I, I, I want to start. I, I can't. Okay, go ahead, because I can't think of anything substantial. Go ahead, Johnny. Wow, I, I can. <laughs> uh, no, the only reason I can is because in your packet for every month, I'm going to try to have um, the minutes in the packet now. So there's a lot of good things in here to read. A lot of things happen at the meeting. Couple things. Um, um, they had a meeting on September 11th down at the, uh, the TTC. Oh, yeah, I went to. Uh, did you go? And uh, Governor Polis spoke, and then they took a ride on the first hydrogen train. Um, so it's a really unique center down there in Pueblo. They actually have two. They have a test center, and then they also have this new center. So their Pueblo's got a big transit uh, rail component center down there. Um, Really a lot of discussion on how we're going to staff up the program. 
two people can't run a fourteen billion dollar program. So uh, there's a call out for consultants to help support them on the technical side, and then they're going to be running a staffing pattern for five year budget. I asked for a five year budget. Just don't give me a a budget. We'll I'll balance every year, but I'd like to see what the, what we're planning for in the future. Um, had meetings with the Union Pacific Tier One uh, uh, folks about uh, a potential um, uh, agreement with uh, operators. Uh, planning board is starting to work towards what does that look like? How does an oper how does an operation work? What are our goals? What are our vision? Uh, on September oh, September October 27th, we're having a in person I think four or five hour meeting down in Pueblo to set our visions, our goals, and our strategies and work through what what do we really want to achieve and how do we want operations to look and what do we want to get done. Uh, and the TLR, they, we submitted a bill for some tidy cleanups to the um, uh, draft bill to the TLRC about how we want to clean up this thing. One of the things that I think is interesting to this group right now, the North Front Range and some of the MPOs got to the, have to be a uh, be certified by the Senate, but they're taking out the reps for the MPOs that are on it and just whoever the MPOs elect to be on it, like you guys like Will and I, that that would have to go to Senate confirmation. And so I think that's wise mm -hmm. because it's white, white, because we could change every year and then all of a sudden it's going down. Mm -hmm. So that was some of the major things that happened. And TLR, I did hear, I think the TLRC, I saw an email, Will you correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I think the TLRC approved one of their five bills to go to uh, the committee bills to move forward to yes. change some of those. Super. Anything further, Will? No, no. That was a great report, Johnny. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Paula, would you like to tell us what's going on around uh, LaSalle? Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for coming down. Uh, we, of course, had dinner provided by Don Juan's next door. Yes, you did. And mm -hmm. the dessert was from our new bakery, uh, Robert's Family Bakery, which is right next to Subway oh. in the center there. Wonderful. Um, we've had five or six new businesses just in the last few months move into the 85 corridor. So we're really seeing some, some uptick in, in right. industrial and businesses here. Uh, we're working currently through our bridge grant with our Main Street Bridge, uh, getting the plans and, and stuff together for the hopefully starting in the spring, depending on winter weather. Uh, we paved our last dirt street in town just last week. It got finished. So we now have fully paved streets in town. Grown up city. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, hey, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Yeah. And just like everybody else, we're working on budget and trying to figure out new things coming and planning for the future. Super. Thank you. I Thank will you uh, adjourn the meeting. Oh, oh, I will not adjourn the meeting. She's quick. <laughs> uh, next month's agenda topic suggestions. I don't, can I, can I don't I? remember ever talking about that, but that's all right. <laughs> well, do you have one? <laughs> I actually do. And here's the problem is that Bustang is starting to cancel um, yes. uh, time slots in yeah, our area. Yeah. Like all of a sudden people show up and it's the 7.30 bus, oh, you know what, it's not coming. I've had people have to get to, together to get on a Uber together. I've had people that are stranded in Denver. I've had, I mean, these are people, these are just people I know. This is not people, like constituents that reached out to me. Um, I think Trisha Canonico's husband showed up once to try to get the bus and had him run back home and grab his car and drive to Denver. So, Bustang is canceling um, routes and not telling anybody and not informing things. So, I guess I would like to know, like maybe we could have C come and explain why that's happening. And is that happening everywhere else, like on the I-70 corridor? Is that just happening on North I-25? Because we have put a lot of investments in mobility hubs on I-25. And if we're not getting a bus, we were at one point promised that the frequency would double, especially when we got the, the hubs in. And now we can't even get the buses that are scheduled to show up going either way. And my guess is that the I-70 corridor is not having the same problem. So how do we get that fixed? 
Um, City nice. Greeley and Laramie County agree on this one. <laughs> <laughs> For the record. We did it. I, uh, is that a motion? <laughs> so, I mean, so, no. so I guess I would just like to hit, hear something from um, CDOT about what, how they're going to address that, what's going to happen. And then at one point we were told that the frequency was going to double. Mm -hmm. And then we were told, then it was sort of scaled back and said, oh, we're going to look into it. And now we can't even get the routes that we have. So are there solutions going to be in place? And could CDOT come talk to us about I did that? see a newspaper article. I can't remember from where, but it was due to the driving shortage which is fine right but we still need to discuss it in my yeah. opinion, i definitely I support it so, so if we could have somebody speak about that i would be happy with it. So if i could add to this your your comment is well timed because i do have a a call with paul derosha who's the new head of dtr tomorrow morning um, to talk about some other issues but um, i could also ask him about that and see if he'd be willing to come and talk to council we're mad we spent, you know, how much money of our combined sixty million dollars or combined money on I twenty five? I mean, for, and you know, including mobility hubs. And I mean, we have mobility hubs. If we don't have buses that are stopping at that, then why the heck did we spend the millions of dollars to get those mobility hubs in place? I think the more important thing is, if you can't rely on a bus, you're not going to take a bus. Yeah, right. Future. Yeah, absolutely. that's the number one thing. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I mean, reliability. So that's been a frustration for our residents. Right. I'll find out tomorrow if we can get them to come and talk. Thank you. So, for the record, if it wasn't for Kristen, I would have been on time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Close enough, huh? All right, we're adjourned. Thank you. Good job. Hey, by the way, I don't sit yeah. down yet. Just look, read the thing from Heather. That's huge. Oh, wow. Say, use that money to buy some bus drivers. <laughs> and you know what? And I think it goes up. Your first offense is seventy-five. Your next offense is hundred, up to two hundred and fifty. Up to two hundred fifty when you're out there. I, I have to be honest. I went down to Denver, all the way down to Monument on Sunday for, which is the first. I went all the way down to Monument for a hockey game for my son. I'm scared to death to even get in the lane now. I know. I watched because I mean, there's cameras watching everything. I'm thinking, what if all of a sudden I had to dodge out of the lane to avoid something or you know whatever? They would still write you I just remember that our band folks like have had like they have a band.